I'm gonna you go ahead and blab Mike and then we'll introduce ourselves again. I'm gonna put this in all the different groups for now. Okay. For those of you who are watching the replay, just skip ahead a couple minutes or something. And yeah. We'll get this thing started. Okay. Um, how's the uh, how's the weather? I guess. <laughs> how's the weather? That's what everybody talks. About. <laughs> Not, uh, how about how about for you? How's the weather for you? Uh, Vegas, uh, sunny. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Vegas. Right. <laughs> a surprise. <laughs> yeah. What a surprise. Sunny, really hot, right? Oh yeah. Uh. Okay, I'm trying to refresh all this stuff. Facebook, don't kill me. <laughs> oh, man. How's the school going for you? I guess we'll get into that later. Done with classes. How about you? Are you still taking classes? Or are you uh, uh, Class-wise, you... done. Just internship and okay. guest paper boards. So which one are you on? Are you on your, like, how many do you have and which one are you on? Yeah, the way my school does it is uh, we do three. They're all during the final year, and so I'm on the second one. Okay. Are they longer? Like, I, I'm assuming they're longer. For the most part, yes. The one I'm on right now is a little shorter, eight weeks, because we had class right before. Okay. But, yeah. So then... Where, what, how long is the next one, and what, what, which ones are they like? Oh yeah, so I did private practice outpatient ortho for my first, okay. and then uh, right now I'm doing peds. It's a more rural area, and then my last one uh, will be acute care. Okay, it, cool. Hospital, a little inland, but Southern California area. And let's see, got one more spot to hit. Uh, okay. How about um, your school? The way. Uh... So we do four. Um, the first one is basically we have a shortened semester of classes, and then right after, right away, we start a clinical. So I did a six week clinical at nice. a nursing facility in um, Brooklyn. Um, then the second one is during the summer after our second year classes. Right. So that one I did in outpatient orthopedics in Brooklyn again. My third one is my longest one. It's, I want to say, 11 weeks. Um, it's out in Pennsylvania. I'm in Pennsylvania right now for it. Um, okay. Outpatient ortho. And then my last one will be in Chicago for, like, I think, I want to say, nine, ten weeks. Um that's private practice uh, pelvic health. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we are good to go. Okay. We'll get started. Thank you for our two viewers. I can't see who they are right now, but thanks for watching. And all right, so welcome everyone. My name is Matt Vegas. This is Mike Mayer, and we're just chatting about being curious as DPT students. And I will let Mike take it away with a little Quick introduction about yourself for those who do not know who you are. Okay. Go for it. So my name's hard to pronounce, the last name. It's Mawker, but that's um, – oh. I'm, a, I'm a third-year student at the from the City University of New York's College of Staten Island, um, physical, doctor of physical therapy program, currently on my second-to-last clinical in the outpatient orthopedic setting, dealing with a lot of – patients suffering from chronic pain, a little bit of sports rehab, uh, generally chronic, a lot of chronic pain. Um, <laughs> I'm very curious about the orthopedic setting, upper extremity injuries, low back pain, um, knee pain, hip pain, general orthopedics, sports, stuff like that. Um, and I'm very curious about research. I try to look into it a lot. And that's about it. Yeah, cool. Awesome. And so just taking a little bit back, like what was it that got you into PT school overall, into the field of physical therapy overall, and then going into your PT school? I know you did do a little bit of research for where you are going uh, with your DPT program, and I think that's certainly something worth, uh, worth sharing. Okay, so believe it or not, I have a weird story. So usually people go to PT 
like the people who go to PT school are like former athletes who had a great experience with PT or somebody who had some fantastic experience with PT and they were like, oh, I love this. I actually had a really bad experience with PT initially. I had um, I had a congenital issue, or what we believe is a congenital issue. Um, on my right hand, I had surgery, very complex. Um, uh, so, like, they had to move muscle around. They had to, re like, it's like restructuring structures um, in there. And um, the surgeon gave us a script for PT. He couldn't refer us to anybody that he would recommend because we weren't close. Um, this is yeah. a guy who's a specialist in Philadelphia, and um, I forget where the other area was, but it wasn't close to us. So my mom went to the closest physical therapist she could find that took her insurance, which was some guy in the back of a gym. Oh, wow. And I'm a, like, a, like I want to say, 11-year-old kid. I had surgery. I have no idea. He comes in. He takes, he prints out, a, like, exercise from a software you know one of those old school black and white if you've seen it right tells me to do it i don't know how i don't think it made any difference i had no idea i was always and i always like through the years thought like what was the point of that what would be the value what does pt do and i kind of looked into it. i was like okay it could be better i'm always wondering what could have been done to help me right um went to penn state they have a program at their Abington campus, which is associated with Thomas Jefferson's PT program. Mm -hmm. It's like a three plus three. And um, it sounded really intense because the GPA was like a 3.5 minimum at, to get in. And you still had to interview and all this stuff. And science was in my forte in high school. Right. So I was like, okay. But um, graduated with a bachelor's in economics from Penn State's Smeal College. Really, it was a bad time. Mortgage crisis hit in 2008, still affecting me in 2010 when I graduated. Like people, most people I knew weren't getting jobs. It was really bad. So I was like, okay, I was getting interviews, but I was like, I really don't want to sit in a cubicle. So mm -hmm. I explored other options. I went and I was like, I'm really interested in this physical therapy thing. It's a little intimidating, the science classes, but I'm going to go take a look. So I happened to get recommended to go to a place which is supposed to be one of the worst settings, workers comp. Mm -hmm. And, you know, generally people are like, oh, they lie. They they're they're not they're pretending to not make progress. They're not incentivized to to do things because they just want to win a lawsuit. And I went in there and I saw amazing things. I saw a patient who got run over by a truck and he was able to run a year later. Wow. And yeah, so I got to see like stuff. I was like, wow, this is cool. I was like, so this is legitimate. I thought it could be legitimate. I didn't have a good experience. I always wondered, could it be done better for me? And here I am seeing somebody who had something tragic happen to them and they recovered. So from there, I took the classes, I took all the prereqs, and I just started looking into schools that were relatively affordable. Mm -hmm. so, like, the cost was less than the salary, the average salary for new grads. And the requirements weren't like, oh, you have to take like, you have to be basically a bio major, which some right. schools require more requirements than others. Fortunately for me, in New York, they have two programs that fit my criteria. So I applied to those programs and I got into one of them, which right. is College of Staten Island. Right. And were they through the PT casts? I can't remember. No. I know. So okay. the thing yeah. is Hunter and CSI, as we call them, they intentionally don't want to be part of PTCAS. And the reason being, as it was explained to me, was basically when they go into PTCAS, they get a bunch of random applicants. So they have to sift through each applicant. And this could be a garbage applicant. This could be an applicant who doesn't care. They're just applying for the sake of it. It could be somebody who's like, oh, this is like my fifth option. And when you get like, 700 plus applicants for your program at, as an admissions group, that's really difficult. That's a challenge. Whereas with my program, they get like 200 to 300. Mm -hmm. That's more reasonable. They can filter through, they can interview a large percentage of applicants and really get to know the applicants before making a decision. And so that's why 
Hunter and CSI both feel that way. Cool. Awesome. And so like having that fear with science classes, how did you overcome that and then sort of transition over to where you are now with like actually looking into research and being interested with things like chronic pain? Okay. So that's, um, we'll start with the science class. So Go for it. Go I, for it. I was an economics major and if you took, I don't know if you took economics, but a lot mm -hmm. of people who take economics are like, this is really boring. And so <laughs> when you go up the level, and the reason I became an economics major was because it was recommended to me as the major in business school that would teach me the most. And I do agree it did teach me the most. Out of all the majors, I don't think finance would have taught me as much. I don't think accounting would have taught me as much. Mm. It's really um, an all-around major. But it's not um, necessarily a major that attracts employers, but it is a fantastic major in terms of critical thinking, reasoning, and statistical knowledge. So that major was tough. That mm -hmm. was a hard major. I did not realize it was going to be that hard. I was in the Bachelor's of Science program, not the Bachelor's of Arts program. So that means I had to take additional statistics classes, like e specifically econometrics, which mean, which is a class where you literally don't have a calculator and you have to do math. Oh. So you go in, you've got pages, like it's like five or six pages at least, and you have to do all the math, like just writing it out. You cannot, you can't use a calculator. So that's, that's tough. I mean, I showed it to engineering majors and they were like, that looks tough. And they never had to do anything like that. So after that experience, I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. And I took I took, um, what did I take first? I took physics one and anatomy, I want to say, and they were just really easy for me compared to like senior level economics courses. It was like a piece of cake. And then I kept taking classes. And the only class I really struggled in was um, physics two, electricity and magnetism. That wasn't easy, even though like I actively sought out help. Um, so I did pretty well. I think I got like over a three seven in the prereq, something like that. Um, and I took the GRE, didn't study for it, did fine. Um, even though apparently the programs I applied to don't care about GRE. So that's it. Awesome. Um, so that's how I overcame. I took them like piecemeal, like two at a time or one at one or two at a time. So um, it was definitely doable. Nice. Um, in terms of the chronic pain stuff. Mm -hmm. So I had finished um, some coursework and I had no idea what was going on with certain patients that I had seen. Like the stuff in school didn't explain stuff. And it right. seemed a little bit, the instructor seemed to go on and on about stuff that didn't seem scientific, which is because they have to teach to the board exam and sometimes that means memorizing numbers or whatever right and have time to explain I, that i'm gonna defend her in this case but it didn't explain people who are suffering from debilitating pain and i went online and i saw this podcast by karen litzy healthy mm -hmm. wealthy and smart and she talked about it a bit and then i heard um about this guy who had graduated from my program and worked for a prince in Saudi Arabia. And I found out that's what he does a lot. He does a lot of chronic pain stuff. Hmm. So I went to observe him and he really like taught me a lot about chronic pain. Uh, his name is Jonathan Fass. Um, and um, he's really like hardcore, like evidence-based. He's all about hardcore evidence-based practice. And awesome. Um, his wife suffers from chronic pain and he's really like, that's really important to him. So he was like, look, it's a really big issue. People are not really w educated about it. And we went through like some of the basics. He gave me some resources. Like um, he told me about therapeutic neuroscience education by Adrian Lowe and Emilio uh -huh. Quintadora and uh, explained pain by Lorimer Mosley and David Butler. So I started looking into that stuff. And he's really the first person who emphasized the value of research in a way that I could understand from a clinical standpoint. You know, in my school, we do a lot of research, but it's not really explained well in terms of mm -hmm. how it applies to the clinic. 
You know, it's because a lot of the people who are teaching the research are researchers and not clinicians. So it's kind right. of it's hard to explain because these are these are people who get million dollar grants and they're really, really smart. But they don't quite know how to, like, explain it to us mm -hmm. in a way that works for us. To, to say, hey, this is how this applies to clinic. They're just like, you have to know this, end of story, moving on, kind of like that. Because they're really high-level people, and to them, we're, I don't know. I, I'm not going to comment about that. But, yeah, so evidence-based practice has become very, very important to me as a result of my time around Jonathan from the podcast, hearing about it, Karen's. Karen brings on a lot of people who are fantastic. Yes. I think she's had, like, well over 300 episodes and she's brought in people who are like amazing physicians kareem khan um who's like editor-in-chief of the british journal of sports medicine she's had other people and um neil o'connell i think was on there who's right now at the san diego pain summit mm -hmm. um just a lot of people who are really really knowledgeable about the evidence and it gives great exposure to people who listen yeah that's awesome and so I guess, was it listening to uh, Karen's podcast that sort of drew you in to attending the Woman in PT conference? Because that's, uh, I had heard about your name before, but that's when I like really knew about you. Oh, okay. Um, oh, somebody put Karen who again? Karen Litzy is a physical therapist in New York City. Um, she's she's a podcast host she has a very successful podcast for those who aren't aware if you check out healthy wealthy and smart it's a pretty good podcast for those interested in physical therapy and she's a concierge pt so she visits people in their homes which is pretty high-end stuff considering mm -hmm. it's all cash um in new york city but um yeah, so um, I wouldn't say the podcast per se got me interested in the Women PT Summit. It's the freak they post. Uh, they post a lot on mm -hmm. social media, and I knew all of the organizers. I knew Karen, I knew Sandra Hilton, Sandy, and I knew Erica Malo. So all of these people are great. They're really knowledgeable, and so I'm following them already. And they're posting about this Women PT Summit. And I know from my own personal experience, my mom has voiced how it's definitely different for women than men in the workplace. And she's talked about um, how, like, you know, she's had bosses who have made inappropriate remarks. They're sexist and racist um, and anti-Semitic and ethnically um, ignorant. Um, and she's felt she can't speak up. She feels disempowered by the whole um, environment at work. And this is at multiple jobs. And right. she feels like she doesn't have power in that setting. And I've heard her talk to her friends and they feel the same way. And I've talked to other people in the workplace and they're like, yeah, it's really, I can't say anything because like this person's clearly a sexist, but if I speak up, I'm gonna get fired. And what's my recourse? I go to court, maybe I win, maybe I don't. Like, it's very, very, like, not, it's just not good, you know, like, and so women in PT, um, while women are still the majority uh, in terms of, like, gender percentage wise, um, they're the majority in physical therapy. They're not the significant majority, and they're often um, not respected as much as they should be, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but that's the case. So I got interested in that. I went and I said, I will volunteer, Karen. If there is an opportunity to volunteer, I will help you. And she's like, right away, she told me, let's do it. You'll be the first male volunteer. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it. And I was willing to help out. Ironically, I don't feel I helped out as much as the other volunteers. So like um, Emily, Ruben, Nicole Whitney, and Felicia, well, I want to say Wansa. I Why not? Wanna okay, see there you go. They did a lot more work than me, and I, I want to give them credit for that. So they were really great. Um, but we all tried to help out as much as we could during the event. Cool, that's awesome. And so, what were some of your big takeaways from going to there, from volunteering at the Women in PT Summit? Biggest takeaways. Um, It, 
it's you know it's like it's it's just a better realization of what women go through like um i want i want to say it was ellie summers yeah it was ellie summers she went up and she spoke about her experience and how her husband um were, had similar qualifications at her as her and at the same time every time they went up for a job he would get the better pay he would get the better offer every single time right she had, she had women make anti what's called anti feminine remarks to her like something about like you know if you were pregnant i would have helped you out more or something like ridiculous like that it was like really like it was like self hate kind of like these these some of these employers were doing sometimes with the men somebody smacked her on on her butt like at work it's just not it wasn't good and people kept like not like everybody's like nine there i'm like wow like the me too thing is legitimate and they really emphasize that there so like really comp just another reminder of how how bad it is out there for our female colleagues it's really important to be mindful and respectful and consider of what we say because you know we're we're programmed culturally to kind of be sexist i think you know the tv movies culture we're kind of like programmed to be like hey look at a woman as an object hey look at a woman based on her looks hey you know good looking girls are stupid because the this stupid movie told me this and we don't think enough like hey maybe we should respect these people and be more considerate about it. at least in my opinion that's <laughs> my opinion um we're not as considerate and it got me more mindful of even though i was already trying to be considerate how important it is to take a step back and think what are my biases that are inappropriate against women or anybody and that applies to you know like cultural bias racial bias and gender bias and, and sexual orientation bias all of that we have to be at least i feel i have to be more mindful of that oh yeah, oh, yeah. and to me that was that was really great awesome, awesome. and um, as far as, as, far as like, like the science or the leadership what were some other things that were discussed during the conference? Because I, I didn't attend. I got to see people who were there, but I I didn't really know what was going on. Uh, yeah, it's not really um, – I don't want to say it's like science. It's more about leadership. It's okay. really about leadership for women. It seemed like that was – I mean – that might be a mischaracterization. So watch out. If somebody watches this and says, like, I'm wrong, <laughs> then I'm wrong. Right. But it's supposed to motivate, inspire, and encourage leadership and, and um, um, you know, really leaning in. Uh, in a, that's an example. Sheryl Sandberg um, wrote a book called Lean In, and some people cite that. So really taking on that, like, ownership of what you're capable of, um, and in this case for women. And that's what that conference was really about. Awesome. And so shameless plug for uh, the group that we have. We're actually live within that group right now with the, the CSM PT conference attendees and then just trying to virtually connect so that when we finally meet in person, it's less awkward. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anything that you want to share as far as um, your experiences with going to conferences like CSM and just general tips for people who maybe they've never been, or maybe they're looking for something different. Sure. Um, so one of the things I think that helped me is social media connecting with people. Um, I didn't meet a lot of people that I hadn't already spoken to online and I met a ton of people. So I met so many people in person for the first time that I spoke to online. I, I think I met well over a hundred people at CSM. Um, and I had spoken to almost all of them online. Uh, so, and people were like actively trying to meet me, which was interesting. Wow. I was surprised, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so it's really easy. You just go on Twitter, you go on Facebook, whatever you get involved, you start talking and people are really, really nice. Um, coming from a business background, 
people are not nearly as nice in the business world as they are in the healthcare, well, at least in the PT world. And people were super nice and they really wanted to go out of their way to help me, whether it's online or even at conferences. And um, I've had long conversations with people asking them questions and they were more than happy to do it. So my advice, get on social media, connect with people, really talk to them. Um, doesn't matter how big the person is. I mean, there's a few exceptions. Um, some are like the high, high and sports guys um, aren't as involved online, um, but that's because they're busy. They're making money. They're seeing like superstar athletes, but um, you know, whether it's Karen or Sandy or um, even, even people like Adam Meekins, who's very outspoken, um, they will talk to students. Um, they will interact with you. Um, maybe they won't be at the conference you're going to, but you can interact with them and really like ask them pretty much any question and they'll be happy to answer. And then they'll meet you in person and be like, hey, I remember you, which is surprising because they're busy people. Yeah, it's true. Hey, Jenna. And uh, I guess one thing to share with me is how last year and just seeing this drastic change like every every year every time a different experience for me and then realizing that like oh yeah we're already friends on facebook <laughs> especially like oh yeah like sitting on an airplane seat right next to uh matt debole who created the doctor of physical therapy students facebook group and being able to chat about that and just yeah like mike said people are very open very willing to connect and yeah definitely do join our group. I'll post it in the comments below. And yeah, Mike, any any big like pearls, any wisdom, any advice that you would share for DPG students like ourselves, regardless of school, just, um, I don't know, any experiences could be related to clinical internships, conferences, anything you wanna share? Sure. Um, one of the things I noticed is some people get a little, um... So there's like two perspectives I've seen. I've seen people who are really lazy in terms of like trying to get like quality clinicals and they just rely on the lists that are provided in their school or whatever the system is. I know some schools use a lottery system, but if you can get a choice, I would say go out there and try to find clinicals that suit your interests. Uh, that's what I did. And you don't necessarily need a fancy resume or a cover letter or whatever. Just go out and connect with people. I got my last two clinicals because I connected with people. That's it. Social media right there. And then um, the, um, the advice I would have is when you go to school, remember that in school they are covering stuff generally because they have to, but that doesn't mean you should take it as like hard fact. So when you graduate, think of it as, they are teaching me to be a licensed clinician and for me to look into stuff more. It's really, they're teaching you how to learn independently. And when you go out in the clinical setting, when you're actually in the real world, that's where the big learning occurs. It's through the years. That's why people are emphasizing the residency model or whatever. It's because you learn in the clinic a lot of what you do. You learn one thing in school, whether like arthrokinematics, you're going to learn a lot about arthrokinematics in school. And then you might realize, hey, um, maybe kinetics is are more important than arthrokinematics. Mm -hmm. The biopsychosocial thing, that's not really emphasized at a lot of schools. Uh, it's not emphasized in my school, at least. Um, you go out in the real world, you realize, oh, there's definitely a psychological variable involved. There's definitely a social variable. There's stuff I can't do anything about. There's stuff... Maybe I can, but I don't know enough right now. Maybe I should educate myself more about that. So really uh, be mindful of that and look into resources. Look into the evidence. Don't just blindly read blogs. Blogs are nice. Um, doesn't matter who it is, but they're always biased. So go in, read the research, consider it. I know that's hard, but try your best. That's yeah, best. awesome. That was great. And then I guess one thing... Uh, before we go, one thing you're really looking forward to could be general, anything you want to share. Um, I'm really looking forward to 
figuring out, like feeling like I know a little bit in the clinic. Like I feel every day in the clinic, I'm like, wow, I really don't know that much at all. And it's a, it's it. And I think like really gaining that confidence, whether that's through going to conferences or courses or just getting clinical practice. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm too, too humble about it. I, some people say that I don't think so. Um, but um, I think gaining that confidence, that is the thing I look forward to the most um, because I think that's what separates that comfort and discomfort in the clinic. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for hopping on, Mike. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll post in the bottom in the comments about the little group we got for those of you who are attending CSM. So we hope to see you there. I'll definitely look forward to catching you in person, Mike. All right. See you then. Adios, everyone. Let's see. Got to click in.